My older brother Jamie died seven months ago. He was 20. Before he died, he wrote a letter for me and another for our dad. His letter to me was him apologizing for leaving, saying he loved me, wanted me to have a good life and things like that. Dad's letter was different. Jamie told Dad we always knew he cheated on our mom, that he was disgusted to be his son, that he didn't tell him he was sick because he didn't want Dad to fake grieve him like he did our mom, he didn't want Dad's tears or anguish, that he felt like Dad not getting the chance to say goodbye was justice for his affair, his affair child, and the crap he put the two of us through when we were so young and losing our mom. I only know the content of Dad's letter because he told me about it and wanted to know if I felt similar in any way, and I told him I did. My dad has other kids with his wife, the affair partner, or one of them. My half-sister's a tween and tween, and my half-brother is pre-tween. I'm nearly an adult male. And the timeline was my mom was sick for like a year. She died when I was five. Dad had a baby again only months after she died, and his wife was already living with us before that point. Dad never explained it to us. He relied on us being young and boys and not knowing enough about pregnancy to realize. My brother always kept his distance from our half-siblings and he wanted no part of being their brother. I feel similar but I'll try to be nice because we live in the same house. But now that Jamie's gone, I feel like I lost my only sibling and I don't love or care about my half-siblings or think of them as real siblings. That might be why I'm resisting here, but anyway, Dad knows I have a letter from Jamie. But Jamie didn't write anything to our half-siblings, so Dad wants to make a copy of the letter and make it look like it's to all of us, so edit it. He said ever since the girls found out I got one, they've been upset, and they grieve for Jamie too, and they don't deserve the weight of being unloved by their brother and knowing they'll never get to have a kind message from Jamie. He said Jamie never said I love you to them, hugged them, or gave them any of his heart, and it's not their fault, but some of the pain can be eased if they think he thought of them. He said we'll just say I was being possessive of the letter and it was never just mine. I didn't agree to share the letter and I told Dad I didn't want him to edit it. He got really angry at me and asked me how I could have such a small age gap between me and my half-sister, how I could live with them for 11 years and not want to save them from this. He asked me if I'd become such a monster. Am I the idiot? Good grief, not the idiot. About the age gap, Dad, I think that was all down to you and your mistress. The letter is yours. Lying like your dad suggests will always be found out. Keep your letter safe. Your dad will probably take it. That part made me chuckle as well. OP is better than me because I would have said, well, there's such a small age gap because you were sleeping with half-sister's mother while still married to my dying mother. And I've lived with them for 11 years because my own mother is dead, so there's really nowhere else for me to go, unfortunately. So your brother's final words were to tell your dad what an idiot he is and his response is to be a bigger idiot? Can you start moving your things out? Anything sentimental and important to you, your mom's stuff or your brother's stuff, and your important documents. That way you can cut these people off and never see them again until you turn 18. Geez, he calls you a monster. Has he looked in the mirror often? Exactly, I could not believe when I read that. This man cheated on his dying wife, lied to his kids, messed up his family, and even after his son's letter to him, continues to lie and manipulate and hurt his family. The only monster here is him, and the affair partner too. Unbelievable. Not the idiot, OP, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Your brother's love and memory live on in you, and I hope you find good people to surround yourself with as a true family. Tell Dad to forge his own letter if he wants, but he's not getting yours. And yeah, he shouldn't be arguing about that small age gap as a plus. I, 36 male, am a dad to a young grammar school aged twins, and my wife, 28 female, is a stay-at-home mom who has recently gone full crunchy mom mode. She's all about essential oils, no processed foods, cloth diapers when they were babies, and she's absolutely against anything mainstream. For the longest time, I didn't mind because it's about healthy living, and I want the best for our kids. But things are starting to get way out of control. The latest issue is that my wife is dead set on homeschooling the twins. She's convinced that public school is toxic and that our kids won't thrive in a system that's designed to make them little robots. She even has a few friends in her crunchy mom group who homeschool their kids, and she's been talking non-stop about joining their co-op. I've expressed my concerns about this from the beginning. I work full-time, and I don't think she realizes how hard it's going to be to homeschool two kids while giving them a proper education. But she won't hear it. Anytime I bring up public school, she shuts it down immediately, 
saying she doesn't want the twins to get bullied or that we'll lose control of what they're learning. I just don't think homeschooling is realistic and I can't see how she'll keep them on any sort of consistent schedule. I gave her time to prove me wrong over the summer, thinking maybe she'd ease into it and have a plan. Instead, she spent most of the time bouncing between different unschooling philosophies and signing them up for random activities with her crunchy mom friends. The kids are constantly bored and I've seen them starting to fall behind. I'm not proud to admit it, but I went behind her back and enrolled the twins in public school for the fall. I told her a few weeks before school started and she lost it. She accused me of betraying her and said I was undermining her role as a mother. She keeps saying I don't trust her to raise our kids, which isn't true. I just don't think she's prepared to handle homeschooling and I don't want the twins to suffer because of it. She spent the whole first week of school trying to make me feel guilty by saying the twins were miserable and that I'd ruin their childhoods by forcing them into the system. The thing is, as far as I can tell, the twins actually loved their first week of school. They've made friends and liked their teacher, but my wife keeps insisting they just pretend to like it to make me happy. Now she's talking about pulling them out mid-year and starting over with her homeschooling plan, but I'm putting my foot down. I want the best for my kids and I honestly think public school is the right choice for them right now. My wife is making me feel like I'm the bad guy for going behind her back and forcing them into something she was so against. Am I the idiot for enrolling the twins in public school without her consent? Should I have handled it differently? I'm starting to feel really guilty about what this is doing to my wife. Not the idiot. Many people who homeschool have absolutely no idea how much work it is. She needs to come up with not only school lessons, but also ways in which they will learn to socialize. And I don't just mean with their tiny in-group of presumably all-white affluent kids of crunchy moms. They need to be exposed to a wide range of people and learn to interact with them all. They need to develop conflict resolution and a million other little social norms and skills that I can't even put into words. The few homeschool kids I've known as adults were really weird. OP, you're heading towards a divorce. She's in a very toxic friend group and you won't break through. For all of its faults, being an active and engaged parent with the options of a public school system will be better for them. Parental involvement, not helicopter parenting, determines success. This is a common fight between ex-couples. OP, if you end up divorced, don't back down on having an education plan written into your divorce or custody document. It's not always standard practice, but you'll need it. Also, discuss with your attorney a medical treatment clause for the children if she's completely against Western medicine. Good luck. My girlfriend was going out with friends on Saturday. There was an event at the club in town, so they went for food, a few drinks, and then to the club. She asked what I was planning for the evening, and I said I'd likely just have a couple of drinks, order some food, play video games, watch Netflix, and have a nice chilled night. She got a bit annoyed and said she might have asked me to pick her up, but I can't if I'm drinking. I said she could always get a taxi like she usually does. She asked if I'd book it for her, and I said I would if I was awake, but there was a good chance I'd already be asleep. She said I should wait then, but I just pointed out that the club night finishes at 3am, so I'm not waiting until 3 just to possibly book a taxi. I pointed out she's more than capable of sorting out her own taxis. She said she wasn't asking for much and that it was only one night, but I said she couldn't expect me to sit around waiting for her. She just said again that she wasn't asking for much and I should be fine with helping her. I told her again to text me when she's finished and if I'm awake I'll book a taxi, but if not, she's more than capable of booking it herself or getting a friend to book it. Am I the idiot for not staying up to book a taxi? Who broke her arms and fingers and mobile device? Why can't she book it herself? Does her phone stop working at 3am? I'm pretty sure you can book a taxi ahead of time too, at least where I live. Not the idiot. She is, though. You're not obligated to stay up late just to book a taxi for your girlfriend, especially when she's capable of doing it herself or asking a friend for help. I think she wants to power play here. Basically, she's trying to see if he would fold on the night she's off having fun out with her friends while he's sitting at home by the window waiting to book a taxi to come back to him. I'm petty enough that I wouldn't book it but would still be awake when she returned. Whatever she says about that, my response would be, you did it yourself and got yourself home and the world didn't stop spinning. Also, isn't this what Uber was designed for? Helping intoxicated partygoers get home? OP, your girlfriend sounds a bit like a piece of work. I, 21 female, recently broke off my engagement to my fiancé, 23 male, because he gave me an ultimatum. Him or my seven younger siblings. 
Two years ago, my mom abandoned us, leaving me to take care of them all by myself. The kids were aged toddlers to tweens, and each of them has a different dad, none of whom are involved. They don't pay child support or have any contact with us, so I'm the only adult in their lives. I work one full-time and two part-time jobs to support them, and I'm constantly exhausted. I work over 80 hours a week. My fiancé knew my situation from the beginning. We were co-workers at one of my jobs. I've been upfront about everything. The sleepless nights, juggling their school and daycare schedules, making meals, helping with homework, and trying to create stability in their lives after our mom walked out. I didn't want them to end up in foster care because I was in foster care myself when I was younger and experienced graphic and violent sexual abuse. I can't risk that happening to them, so I've done everything I can to keep us together as a family. When my fiancé and I first got together, he was understanding, even supportive. But after we got engaged last year, he started changing. He wanted us to focus on our future and move in together, but that wasn't an option for me. I've got seven kids to care for, and I couldn't leave them behind. They've already been abandoned once. A week ago, he sat me down and said he couldn't handle it anymore. He said I was throwing my life away for kids that weren't even mine and that I needed to choose between him and my family. He said he wasn't prepared to live the rest of his life raising someone else's kids and that I was being selfish by refusing to prioritize him. I didn't even hesitate to give him his ring back. I love him, but my siblings always come first. They need me more than he does, and I already spent enough time working and caring for the kids. I don't have time for crap. Now his family is furious. They've been calling me selfish, saying I'm a martyr who's ruining my life for a bunch of kids who should be someone else's responsibility. His mother-in-law even told me I'll regret this choice when I'm alone and miserable in a few years. Part of me wonders if they're right. I never imagined my life would turn out this way and I do miss the idea of having a future with my fiancé. But at the same time, I can't abandon my siblings. They're my responsibility now and I'll do whatever it takes to ensure they're safe and loved. Does that make me an idiot? Not the idiot. The lack of empathy on the part of your former fiancé and his family is staggering. I mean, he's not obliged to want to shoulder the same burden you are carrying, but to try to convince you to abandon those children who have nobody else, what an absolute piece of work. You can do a lot better than that. But you should go for child support. You can't think 80 hours a week is sustainable and you throwing your life away to raise them without help is any kind of life. Go to your county office of child support enforcement. They will file the case on your behalf, serve the fathers, prosecute and collect for you. Kind of a big assumption the state won't take these kids. I get CPS is wildly overworked, but a 21-year-old working 80 hours a week, pretending to raise seven children under tween age? No way. She's not even properly supervising them because she's at work 11 and a half hours a day, all seven days a week, not even counting the commute. Maybe the older kids are stepping in, but this is simply more work than one person can do, let alone one earning what a 21-year-old earns. Agreed, and those baby daddies ain't got jobs. Nobody with a job is sleeping with someone with five kids and five baby daddies, and nobody who gets knocked up that much has the sense to be intimate with men with jobs. Ain't no possible way OP can raise them, because that's enough work for one person doing nothing but childcare, and anyone holding down a job and doing another 30 hours of childcare a week would struggle. I live with my girlfriend. We live in a three-bedroom apartment, but only our bedroom has a bed. One of the rooms is used as an office for me and the other is more of a storage room. My girlfriend went out with a friend at the weekend. When they were out, her friend got a message from someone with proof that her boyfriend was cheating on her. They lived together so she didn't want to go home. My girlfriend told her she could stay with us for the night but didn't tell me until they'd arrived back. My girlfriend asked if I'd have the sofa for the night so her friend could have the bed. I refused since I would not be kicked out of my bed. I told her that her friend could have the sofa but also that it was only meant for the night and she couldn't stay any longer than that. My girlfriend said I was being unfair and that her friend should have the bed, but I just said she could have the sofa or stay somewhere else. Am I the idiot for not giving up my bed? Not the idiot. There's no way in heck I would give up my bed. That's your personal space. To me, that's like asking to borrow someone's underwear. You just don't do that. Your girlfriend should have given you a heads up on her friend staying and she should have discussed it before agreeing. I wouldn't want someone just crashing on my couch all the time either. So while I would put a limit on the stay, I think she should be allowed to stay more than one night, but that's just my opinion. One night is actually an excellent boundary to draw. 
If you don't set an expectation at the start, that one night could turn into a week and suddenly you have a roommate. I'm sure the girl has family and other friends and she can stay in a hotel if needed. Guests, especially unexpected ones, don't get to oust you from your bed. I'm convinced most commenters here don't have close friends. Who treats people this way? When my best friend's girlfriend visited me in my small house, she got the bed and I took the air mattress to the office. That's how you show someone that you respect and care for them. The way a lot of people talk about friendships makes it pretty clear that they have a handful of acquaintances and don't realize it. Also, the people who say the friend should stay at a hotel, what? She wants to stay with her friend who cares about her. Plus, hotels are expensive. That's what I'm trying to say. We all live in a society, and how we treat the people around us affects how they treat us. Of course, this guy has the right to do whatever he wants, but this says major, deeper things about his character to his girlfriend, who seems to have the completely opposite character traits. It will become a bigger schism.